first of all, I will have to read you the trigger warnings. Uh, so there's death, there's dying, there's cancer, there's quite a high amount of metaphoric license, um, which some people I understand in this field may not be comfortable with because it's not strictly science. Um, and there's too much leopard print, but that's not funny because you can't see the slides. <sighs> right. I'm just going to go for it without the slides, everybody. Thank you ever so much for joining. <laughs> I do appreciate it. Um, right. My name is um, Ella. Um, I am an engineer amongst uh, many other things. I'm not a software engineer, <laughs> which means I feel quite out of place, to be honest, at times this weekend. I don't know much about LEDs um, or NFTs or anything. I'm one of those boring mechanical engineers. Uh, oh, yay, again, found my people. Cool, there's some thermodynamics coming up, guys. Uh, right, so I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm a project manager, I'm a speaker, I'm, I'm all sorts of things. But the thing that I kind of want to talk to you about today is actually something that's very difficult to put on a list because there isn't a particularly great universally recognized word for. Um, and that's kind of why I asked in my padding about whether um, you listen to Griefcast because Griefster is the best word that we've found for it so far and it's still not a great, great word, but I am a Griefster. Um, so when I was 24, my partner uh, died of cancer. There was a big picture of him, because he really liked being the center of attention, even more than I do. So I thought I was going to give him his, mo his moment of glory, but unfortunately he will have to wait again. Um, but we met studying uh, engineering. I was a, a master's student, he was doing his PhD. It wasn't love at first sight, this is not a poetic talk in that respect. Um, but we got together. And uh, within a couple of months, he was diagnosed with stage three bowel cancer. For those of you that are not in the cancer club, uh, stage three is locally advanced and possibly spread. So the odds were, were fairly slim at that point. Um, we did everything we could. I'm not going to say lost the battle because that's a whole nother talk that I will come back next year and have slides for. Um, he was, he was given a ter terminal diagnosis uh, the day before our, our second anniversary, and he died uh, within a week. Uh, he was four days away from starting a potentially groundbreaking uh, clinical trial at the Royal Marsden. Big shout out to them. Uh, he would have been patient 001, and maybe things would have been different. But they weren't. Um, funny gif of a disclaimer sign. <laughs> So everybody's experience of grief and death and trauma is going to be different. So this talk is never intended to be kind of a one-size-fits-all version that is, here's some steps I went through, and now I'm fine. Um, everybody's, everybody's experience is different. And from, from what I've understood of kind of grief and, and bereavement is that everybody thinks that everybody's got it better. People that have, have lost somebody through illness think it was probably better to have had it over in, a, in an accident and, and vice versa. And I think the truth is there's no hierarchy uh, to, to grief at all. Um, it's a bit like engineering. There isn't a hierarchy. There should be, <laughs> but there isn't. Um, and uh, we, there, is, there is science that underpins engineering, um, but engineering is really interesting and complex and complicated because it's always different. And I think everybody's death experience is, is very different. And so when I was looking back on losing Craig, um, it became apparent to me that my way of thinking about it actually really relied on engineering, the thing we were both studying. Actually, it had a lot more in common than I thought it did. So I started writing this engineer's guide to grief. And that is what I'm trying to present to you <laughs> without slides today. Uh, so one of the first things uh, you're taught as a mechanical engineer uh, is the laws of thermodynamics. Um, hands up if you've done a bit of thermo in your time. Cool. It's not without its controversy. I'm sure somebody's going to uh, have a little bit of a, about one of my uh, about one of my explanations. It's not without its controversy and its debate, but um, 
this is this is for the purpose of metaphors. Um, it, it's what I'm going to use today. So for those of you that haven't been bored through a first year thermodynamics class, um, it's the branch of physical science that, that deals with the relationship between heat and work and energy. It's really fundamental to many branches of physics and chemistry and engineering. Um, and the first law is quite poetic. The first law of this quite fundamental sequence is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It only changes form. So the energy in a system can be converted. So when you switch on a light switch, it feels like you're creating energy, but you're not. It's just electrical energy being converted into light. Um, and this is just, just proves that in any process, that the total universe of the energy of the universe is the same. The energy is a, is a closed system. Um, the universe is a closed system. And so this is where my metaphors start to come in. Using, I'm just gonna carry on casually like this. That's all right, don't worry. We're all trying our best here. So there's a very cool gif of a space cat kind of flying through the air looking kind of philosophical. And the point I'm trying to make is that Death is less scary when you think that actually we're all just energy and we're all jumbling about. We've always been here forever and we always will be. We're just changing forms. Oh, okay. We're going to do it like this. Okay, so I'll show that gift at the end if we can. Um, but yes, I can draw a certain amount of comfort from this idea that we're all just energy jumbling through, changing forms. Death is actually a lot less scary when you think about it like that. The second law of thermodynamics is that entropy, the, the entropy of the universe tends to a maximum, which sounds very poetic. But entropy is the idea of disorder. It's the amount of disorder that's in the universe. So in thermodynamics, an isolated system is one where heat or matter can't enter or exit uh, a system's boundary. The universe in itself is an isolated system. And its total entropy, that total amount of disorder, it never ever decreases. There's an equation, imagine it. <laughs> this, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> so this is just an aside, because why not right now? Um, I have for ages been asking my partner in the front row to send me on a stand-up comedy course or an improv course. Now I'm doing both right now. So. <laughs> There's only one HDMI, guys. <laughs> okay, basically, in any isolated system, random processes uh, lead to more disorder. And if there is one thing I can tell you about grief, it is disordered. And it really only increases if you stay isolated. So here is now a gif of Ross from Friends looking distressed in a messy room. He went on a date, there was a messy room. I'm a millennial, it was a very iconic sequence. <laughs> so. If the second law of thermodynamics is still a bit vague, then it's like having a very messy bedroom, something I was guilty of as a teenager. If you leave it, there's one down here. You can all come and climb down here and look at it. Right. If you don't clean and tidy your room, it gets more disordered over time. It gets more messy. And then when you eventually come and clean it, the entropy or the disorder of the room that you're trying to clean does decrease, but the entropy outside the room, the big heap of washing, you lying exhausted, oh, holy shit, they're gone. You can read my notes. At this point, I don't care if you read my speaker notes. I'm just happy we've got them. Oh. It's all right. <laughs> I am going to have to do it without my speaker notes, but it's fine. <laughs> it's the Ross gift. Right, so what I was saying about the entropy of the system. So you've cleaned the room. The entropy of the system in it, in that room, is now less. It's looking nice. It's not 
it's not disordered. Um, but outside of the system, there is a lot more entropy. There is heaps of washing everywhere. You are lying on the sofa um, in a big heap. And uh, so the entropy has gone out of the room and it, it's now outside. So it's basically thermodynamics kind of version of a problem shared is a problem halved. Um, and I think that's really important with dealing with bereavement um, is it's not something that can be gone through alone. You need another part of the universe to take some, um, some of your disorder or entropy away from you. I'm gonna have to go really fast now to, to make up for this. Right, so um, who here, given this crowd, uh, has heard of uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross? Yeah, oh, actually not as many as I thought. That's cool. So um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, was a hospice pioneer, a humanitarian, and a psychologist. And in 1969, she produced this. So these were the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. That might, if you didn't know the term, that, that's more common in pop science. Um, so she said, this is the stages that either people who were dying themselves or those left behind would, would go through. And so uh, the day after Craig died, I went on Amazon, bought every single book about Kubler-Ross that I could on next day delivery, <laughs> except they arrived. And the more I read about them, the more I realized that actually in her later life, she really, really regretted writing this sequence because it was really misunderstood by most people like me trying to order the books. We were looking for this checklist, right? Do a bit of denial, cool, we're on to anger. And I just wanted to get through it as quickly as possible. In reality, and what she, she did come to publish later in life was that actually it looked more like this. As I said earlier in my panning, I'm not a software engineer. I had to get the man in the front row to write this for me. But what it means is that actually the stages of grief are infinitely changing. They change every single day and they're never going to stop. It's not a five point checklist that you're going to complete and be okay with. It just goes on forever. So the third law of thermodynamics um, is this one. Um, if, yeah, if you're a perfect crystalline structure, don't at me. Uh, mechanical engineers are very new no joke there. <laughs> but the third law of thermodynamics uh, is that the entropy, as it approaches absolute zero, it will decrease, but it will never actually get to zero. So zero, for those not in the know, is the point where there's no molecular motion. And as I said earlier, motion and heat, they're all the same actually. So if there's no motion, there's no heat. It's cold. In a less nerdy thermometer, it's about minus 273 Celsius. So it's pretty chilly. But unless you are a perfect crystallized structure, which last time I checked, I am not, um, I can never reach actual zero. And I think that's what I found through my therapy journey. So as I said, I bought these books on day one. They arrived on day two, discovered wasn't very helpful what was in them. So day three, I phoned uh, a therapist's office and I cringe every time I think about this phone call. So I phoned and I said, hello, I'm a very important engineer. I have a busy job. Uh, I, uh, my boyfriend has died. Uh, I need to get over this pretty quick because I cannot be on a transatlantic flight looking after some racing cars and just cry. Racing drivers don't like crying. Uh, and yeah, the lady was so calm and so polite and so caring to me. And she said, that's very nice. Um, I'd love to support you through this challenging time. But unfortunately, uh, it's not just something you can get on with. Uh, we don't usually start seeing people for therapy for, for at least three months because as, as prepared as you are, in technical terms, it's called anticipatory grief. So if you know someone's going to die, you do start grieving before they die. Um, as, as much as you think you're prepared, you're probably not. You're probably still in shock. I said, no, it's fine. As you said, I'm an engineer. I'm very smart. We're the smartest part of the population. Uh, <laughs> and I always did my homework, so I know. But honestly, I'm going to ace this. Um, again, anybody that's got a therapist will probably also want to impress the therapist. As it's, and that's an infinite loop. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, um, I said, we need to just book that appointment. I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> 
I didn't prove her wrong. She was exactly right. We started. It was useless for three months. I was up and down. I was doing those five Kubler-Ross things every day. My letter S, my entropy, my disorder was off the charts. Um, so I'd really like to apologize to her. Um, she was she was pretty great. But actually, therapy was brilliant. Um, if, any, if I have one piece of practical advice to, for anybody here who is maybe going through bereavement now, or is, is, I was going to say thinking about it in the future, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> really off doing this off the cuff now. <laughs> um, she, um, it, it is to go to therapy. Um, I had a real strange thing about not wanting to go to therapy because it's like a fluffy kind of science. And as an engineer, that wouldn't work for me. But it genuinely changed everything. Uh, it helped me understand what I was going through, what the people around me was going through, because that's something with grief is that everybody's relationship with that person was different and therefore how they grieve is different and you're all in this melting pot together and it also helped me maybe understand a little bit about maybe what Craig was had had gone through himself um so please please go to therapy it will really help your entropy out so just before um you were all going what how am I doing for time <laughs> sorry just because again <laughs> It's all gone to pot. Cool, now we can do this. So, again, we're just gonna lay it all out on the table here. Uh, so I'd written some pithy line about, <laughs> before you all go back into the sunshine, and I wrote that yesterday, and now you're, you've all just come because it's raining and this is a pretty warm space. So there's this three laws of thermodynamics uh, when you first start studying them. And then, unfortunately, you aren't getting away because it turns out there's a zeroth law. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I thought this as well. Zeroth is not a word. Yeah, it's a word. Uh, so uh, you can thank me and this man, James Clark Maxwell, uh, next time you play Scrabble, because it's a useful word. But there is a zeroth law of thermodynamics. It's actually more of an observation than a law but it's so fundamental to the branch of science that they thought, that's great, let's whiz it up the list, zero if most important. Uh, so <laughs> next time somebody says, you got first, you can say, yeah, but I'm zero, that's great. So the zero if observation law is that if systems are in thermal equilibrium with each other, and there's a third one, and one of them is in equilibrium with them as well, they're all in equilibrium. So if A equals B, B equals C, C also equals A. Um, when Craig first died, I was 24, um, and I really felt very isolated. All the stories I saw about death were like, oh yes, you know, my, my, my granddad died, my grandma's alone, you can talk to my grandma, and I'd be like, yeah, also, that's very nice. And all the grandmas were very sweet, but losing your husband in your 80s is very different to losing your partner when you're 24. Um, I really struggle with language as well. Um, we weren't married, so I felt I couldn't use the term widow. That felt very loaded. And I honestly fretted for weeks and weeks on end about whether I called him my ex-boyfriend. But that didn't work because that made it sound like we'd split up for like a really fliv fri frivolous frivolous thing and like not that just somebody had stopped breathing it's quite it's a bit more than that I tried late partner whoa uh, but that sounded like an overrunning um solicitor so I just don't I still don't have the words so if any uh, people who have been through a similar thing have a word for it please honestly let me know at the end um but now with nearly a decade well more than a decade um in the rear view mirror between that really isolating experience and now I think conversa conversations changed a lot there's a lot more people um talking about um grief and death and I think that's really amazing because actually if I'm an A then there's probably some B's in this audience and there's probably some C's and we're all actually all equal um and I think we need to work together we're all equal in this sadness but we're equal in our courage and our resilience and the strength that comes from these experiences and I think we need to talk about it more. I think it's, it's really important um, because there's such a stigma about talking about death and dying, particularly in the UK. And honestly, I'm quite overwhelmed how many people have come to talk about it because 
honestly, a lot of the time, and again, anybody that's experienced this as well will probably know it, when you say, oh, somebody, <laughs> oh, they died, they just run away scared because they just don't know what to say to you. So I think we need to have more conversations about it. Which brings me on to my final little origin story. <laughs> Math joke. <laughs> uh, so how this talk came about is a, a really good example of that. So I do a lot of corporate speaking about um, being a woman in motorsport. Um, and this brought me to the attention of a TEDx um, event. And they gave me an open brief because that's the literal point of TEDx. Uh, problem was they were expecting some like a light fuzzy story about like being touched on the bum by a racing driver and still doing some science. Um, and what they got <laughs> was a first version of this talk, quite different, less thermo, more composites <laughs> based jokes. Uh, <laughs> but um, they, I sent it in, it came back very heavily edited and by very heavily edited, I mean all references to death, dying or feeling sad were removed from the talk. <sighs> Which didn't give me much to go on, to be honest. So I questioned it and I said, I'm just a little bit confused because I thought the whole point of TEDx was like, it's your thing and this is definitely my thing. Um, and they said, yeah, but we're just a bit concerned that what if somebody's come for a nice day out um, and somebody has died recently and they feel sad and it ruins the event for them. And I just thought, hang on a minute. We can use that trope about death and taxes being the only certain thing. And I don't want to use it because we all know that Amazon doesn't pay their taxes. So if we, <laughs> if we remove the taxes, death is certain. You know, if I'm an A, there's B's, there's C's. So I could have guaranteed that event organizer that there would be somebody. There would be multiple somebodies in every room who's been through some sort of loss experience. And so to me, I didn't want to do the watered down version where we don't talk about it and we reinforce this. Death is scary. You know, it's awful. And, and teach everybody, with, treat everybody with kid gloves because um, it doesn't do us any favors. So my final, uh, this is, sorry, this is the most UK possible <laughs> slide. So if, uh, if you're not from the UK, this was an advert for British Telecom in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and the tagline was, it's good to talk, uh, which sort of brings me on to, yeah, my final thing that I feel sums um, all of this um, metaphor and experience up is that we have to talk. We have to talk to support each other. We have to talk more openly and share our stories so people realize that it is gonna happen to them and they can be prepared. Because if you talk to each other, if you have a think about what you might want to happen when the inevitable happens, you do people like me, the A's, the B's and the C's, a really big favor. Because if you don't talk about death, you don't think what you want to happen to yourself or your bits, um, then you're relying on your A's and B's and C's to make some really big decisions when they're actually at their most vulnerable. And that's really hard. So it, if it seems a bit strange to have like a password manager that somebody knows the password for, or do that weird setting on Facebook or Twitter where you can bequeath your account, please go and do it because it does make it really hard um, for, for, the, for the people left behind. Um, also, just please don't be afraid to, to talk to people who've been through a loss. Um, that disorder, that entropy, that chaos can feel a, a, a lot and it can feel very isolating because of this, this stigma. Um, so offer a person to, a shoulder to cry on, give them some frozen meals. Um, just just to help look after, look after them because they need it. Um, so... Fine, I promise this is the final one. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't do the TEDx event. Um, I, that, was, that was before the pandemic. So this is about four or five years ago. Um, I then um, 
went to therapy for more, as my dad would say it, self-absorbed millennial purposes. I just go to regular therapy, not bereavement therapy now. Um, and during the pandemic, like everybody, I was just having a bit of an existential crisis about like I was putting a lot of effort into things and other people weren't and the results weren't what I want them to be. And oh, just I put effort in. Why doesn't the effort come out? Um, and my therapist is very wise. And she said to me, Ella, feelings aren't equations. You can't complete them or solve them. It sounds very obvious and it somewhat undermines some of my talk, but I think it's a really important coda to this piece is that as much as I want to solve these problems, I'm never going to, I'm never going to find, I'm never going to complete the proof. Um, I'm never going to find X and I don't need to because actually if you give, I just need the tools which therapy has given me to be able to work with what I've got. And if there's anything about engineers um, that we can do is it working with tools. Um, so go to therapy, talk, get the tools, and you can uh, incorporate this um, into your life. It wasn't the poetic ending I was <laughs> aiming for, but given the technical difficulties, I'm just gonna uh, let you get on with the lightning talks. Um, so yes, uh, I, I miss Craig very much. I might have a glory moment in a second, just get his picture up just so uh, uh, he can have his moment of fame. Um, but yeah, so as much as I now know that I can't um, balance this equation, I'm never going to solve this situation. I can still, <laughs> thank you. I can still, uh, Honestly, you're, you're, he'd love this. He'd absolutely love this. So, yeah, as, as much as I now all have these tools, I do still sneakily come back to that first law of thermodynamics and just imagine he's still just energy jumbling through here as I am. So, yeah, thank you for coming to my... Oh, these are... Just honesty. This was so slick. uh uh, uh. Oh, you're just recalling how... Thanks for coming to my not TED talk. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Thanks.